Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 403 that's 403 of the Agostino Zynga show how you doing how you feeling great amazing good to know if it's your first time tuning in via youtube you know what to do smash that like hit subscribe and of course leave me a comment down below and if you're listening via the podcast site please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friend support via patreon is always more than welcomed you can subscribe to my patreon via the link in the description down below at patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o via patreon you'll get one exclusive patreon episode per week only available via patreon so make sure you tune in there i'll be recording a couple in the up and coming weeks and obviously re releasing them exclusively on my patreon page so make sure you check that out going forward i'm gonna make sure i just keep up all the main agassi no zinger shows on this channel and of course on the feed you're listening to and then via patreon there'll be patreon only bonus episodes available via there on that platform so make sure you check that out don't delay jump on there today at patreon.com for just agassi so you know for as little as one dollar one pound per month you can get access to my entire library well yeah entire library up until 400 because obviously i'm going to upload the rest of them but of course you also get access to the bonus show only available via my patreon so make sure you sign up on there anyways what's cracker like him man how's life good you doing all right i'm doing well doing fine um if anything um What's what have I been spending my time doing? Reading, writing, you know, watching movies, the same old nonsense. Um, I've watched something actually pretty good the other day. I started watching a TV show called Industry. It's out now on BBC iPlayer, if you're in the UK, but also out on HBO. It's written by Linda Dunham of Girls fame. So if you're a fan of Girls in the States or you know who Linda Dunham is, then you'd probably be familiar with this series. And it follows a bunch of kids who've just graduated from university and they're sort of doing their graduate program at a uh, financial institution, I guess, you know, a stock firm or whatever, hedge fund, managing firm, whatever it may be. And it's bloody good. It's really fucking good. Um, each character has a very interesting backstory that they sort of come into the series with. There's a lot of really subtle comments, bits of commentary on society, gender dynamics, power, global finance, politics, you know, all the niceties that you'd kind of expect. But again, it's written, I thought, oh no, written, or I think it's produced or directed by Lynn Dumbershoff. It's written by her, screenplay wise. But regardless, in terms of what we see on the TV or on your streaming device, it's all from Lena Dunham's hands. And for one, for myself anyway, particularly, I'm very much surprised. Now that I'm not surprised. I'm surprised that I like it. I guess I like it more because I didn't know she was involved. I think if I would have known prior, I probably would have taken a bit of a swerve just because of her as a person. It's not really her fault in terms of her artistic prowess. I think she's demonstrated with girls however much I despise her character and the way she writ some of those actresses in, uh, the way that she writ some of those actor, uh, characters into the story. From what I've read online regarding the, you know, um, dynamics that, you know, go on in between female friendship groups a lot of the representations are on there although they're a little bit you know over exaggerated they were quite on the money so the things that i kind of got annoyed by this idea that london's character was somehow um in demand in that way she was so such a terrible person in the show london's character it didn't make any sense why all her friends were so keen to be her friend right they were kind of all chasing after her the men in her life the women in her life there was no situation apart from maybe her work and some you know romantic flings that didn't really go that well where i really saw what i would see in real life where somebody like an endonym in real life would probably be ostracized or would be kind of left to their own devices for the most part in it because we've all had those kind of thrones right who are like you know um uniquely narcissistic and your and neurotic and just plain outright crazy if they're your friends you just have to put up with it but you don't indulge them you know what i mean you don't kind of entertain their nonsense you sort of keep them at arm's length and i always fall in girls her character was she got she got she got um you know embraced too often but then again reading up on it and seeing the comments online and reading on um, reading up on some think pieces supposedly the character she plays and how she's portrayed was pretty accurate to what goes on in some um f women friendship groups especially i'd imagine you know that sort of like you know new york downtown upper east side whatever sort of um scene that they're in so 
since then, I've sort of kind of put my personal misgivings about her to one side and thought, you know what? She's actually a pretty decent artist, man. More, more than decent. She's very, very proficient, especially if you consider how young she was when she started Girls, how young she was when she got into Hollywood and started actually producing films, writing screenplays. Like, she's done a lot for somebody as young as she is at this time, especially when you think about how she would mature later on in life. She'll get more, gain more, um, you know, life experiences through marriage and having a family, all this sort of stuff that will definitely go on to inform her art later on. So it, it can only get better. If she was only kind of going off of, I only say that if she was only going off of just her experiences as a young teenager and young adult kind of maneuvering through the streets of New York and in that industry, then imagine how much of a beast she's going to be later on in life when she, you know, decides to venture into other things or highlight different stories or whatever it may be. It's definitely going to be a lot of scope in the artistry. So from what I've seen from industry, it's definitely another example of just how proficient and how kind of high level she is in terms of putting great TVs to get great TV shows together. It's really good. It's, I'm only like two episodes deep now at the moment. I think there's a third just come out. So I've got to um, obviously catch up on that. But if you're struggling for something to watch, definitely check out industry it's available on bbc iplay of course if you're in the uk and available on hbo on most streaming yeah, hbo go and stuff they've got that in the us you could definitely check that out it's really really good man one of my most um uh, it's definitely one of the better recent shows i've watched in a long time for sure 100 percent. so that's been good what else obviously finishing up the hacienda book loads of really great anecdotes and dare still a funny story about um peter hook um, the author of the hacienda book bumping into madonna at a party she was one of the like the first or like big big celebrity um clients and customers that used to kind of pass through at the hacienda back in the days and i guess they kind of bumped into each other at a party and um she basically pretended that she didn't know who he was and he kind of kind of met, motioned over to her like, oh you you were one of the first kind of you know international guests that came and she was like oh it must have been head of a tank i don't remember anything about it or something like that she kind of curved and i thought that was pretty funny epic little moment but yeah that's a really good book man again i'm, I'm reading it more so because i'm trying to remember what it was like to be in a nightclub and there's nothing better than just reading over some old um accounts of you know the clubbing glory days and also the stuff i've been going over was um on resident advisor they've got the event review section which is great for finding out stuff that happened back usually more so for the events that happened back in the day like i stumbled across a post on there from um this is an event listing actually which is when it was flipping amazing there's an event listing on there from i uh, say 2017 um bergheim when um dixon played an 18 hour set 18 hour set in bergheim right this was 2017 i think um this was probably just after the kind of peak of him getting voted some of the top djs obviously in, on ra and some of the comments on there regarding the event were stellar man people describing it as a magical experience he started off with trance they're, they're just kind of you know just sort of giving their feedback on what went down in the night and it's just great to relive all that stuff especially for a place like Bergen, you don't really have any audio or audio visual kind of um reference to kind of go off of so you're sort of having to piece things together with the words that you're reading and the things that you remember in your head it's quite unique in that way isn't it i know i talk about it a lot on this channel but you know hey it's my channel i can do what the hell i want but Bergen is really unique in that in that essence like it's the only place i can think of like in real life that you sort of have to force yourself to remember like you have, you have to force yourself to remember the bits and bobs that you got up to once you were there the first time it sort of reminds me a little bit of like you know like especially if you're older your first kiss or something right or the first time you went to like a really cool place back when you didn't have any way of kind of documenting it or have recording it in any meaningful way you had to really really hold on to your memories whether it was writing something down keeping some sort of memorabilia or whatever it may be you had to you had to really make an effort and i guess that's the great thing about places like that is that it already prepares you like i guess all the you know the all the sort of stories about how you know how to get in and what you gotta wear and how you act in a queue it sort of prepares you mentally physically psychologically whatever it may be physiologically right it prepares you to go in and to have an actual experience that kind of is differentiates himself from the other times you've been out because most of the time the people that have gone 
to go to places, you know, super clubs. I'm assuming, like places like Ibiza, even for the during the, you know the Ibiza season when that's all kicking off and other festivals in mainland Europe and all that stuff. Usually, there are people that you know you're quite uh, used to going out right you're quite used to going clubbing you're used to going festivals this isn't your first time on the rodeo i doubt it very much i'm, I'm sure there's people that exist that say oh my first clubbing experience was burkham my first clubbing experience or my first you know was going to a sub club or whatever it may be but for the most part most people um you tend to sort of have some sort of reference that you come from whether it's a local place that you go to every friday night or somewhere else right but there's definitely places that you're kind of used to going so that space, that place like a burger, it has to do more for you than just be a space to dance. It has to do more to kind of really turn you on, to get you activated. And I think that's the great thing, what they do there at the burger and with, you know, the whole idea about no taking pictures and acting a certain way in the queue and the mystique about getting in and the door picking policy and the way everyone's really about the music on the dance floor. Because it's all well and good doing all this stuff, you know, at the door, right? But it's about the policing inside of it, which is mostly done by the punters themselves. It's not done by this team because there's not enough security to sort of, if you've ever been in Burger and you know how big it is, it's expansive, right? It's a massive behemoth of a, of a nightclub, right? Like what, nearly what, three floors or something or stupid like that, Diff three different rooms. I think now it's maybe five or four rooms at the moment. So it's too big to kind of cover and police in any sort of meaningful way. So you're sort of relying on your community to police themselves and to kind of keep each other in check. And for the most part, they do. Like, you know, I don't think I've ever seen any sort of argy bargy in there, let alone fight. You know what I mean? Like everyone's kind of well behaved, doing the best that they can to immerse themselves in the experience so that they can kind of remember every bit of it and i can just imagine how delightful it will be for the people that decide to go there for their first clubbing experience i'm i'm kind of debating it at the moment too thinking whether or not i should just like hold off from going out anywhere where even when things open up again it's not it's probably a long time coming right maybe the middle of next year or maybe the end of next year whatever, whatever whenever it is i'm thinking do you hold out and just wait to go to like something like that when everything opens up or you go to something local just so you can get a taste of things back on your tongue again i'm not too sure part of me is thinking it doesn't really matter where you go because the first few weeks post lockdown will be magical anyway i think any place you go to even at weatherspoons where being fully open and people be allowed to sit where they want shout talk and whatever jump around is going to be a whole different vibe so um i don't know man just reminiscing over that as you can tell you know just missing flipping club culture and dancing on the dance floor and that's the thing as well like as much as i'm missing djing myself right and having that as a sort of like quasi side hobby that i do every weekend was you know something that again I, 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 at the time i never took it for granted anyway because i think a lot of people in my position who have got the experience level that i have or you know the knowledge that i have or the taste level that i have will probably be a little bit more let's say be a little bit more would probably put their nose up a bit at the gigs i was playing in the bars and pubs right you'd probably want to be a little bit more purposeful and make sure you play at certain places for certain club nights da, 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 da. but i'm not that guy i don't want to be asking people for things i want to do my own thing i just not that dude to start sucking people off to get set places i just want to do my own stuff so that requires me to just start from the ground up hustle for gigs in local bars and clubs and stuff and just start off that way but I really just enjoyed the ambiance of it, right? Rocking up with your set list, um, f you know, frantically panicking that you forgot your, you know, your flipping headphone jack adapter, plugging in your stuff, figuring out that the sound system is flipping gash and having to make the best of that, taking requests, ignoring requests, like, like you know, dancing with people on the dance floor mid set, hanging out with the bartenders after it, like that was all part of the experience, and that was made made it magical. So it wasn't, you know, didn't really give a shit that I wasn't playing in Panorama Bar, which of course I would love to one day, um, or whatever it may be. It was just the idea that oh, I'm doing that same thing that I see all my idols and people that I look up to doing on my level, and I'm really having a whale of a time, and I'd always go out my way to make it interesting, right? Every set I'd play, I'd make sure I didn't play the same set one to one to whatever tunes i'd always mix it up i'd always be crate digging just trying to make it as much of a real which it was real because i'm you know I'm, I'm getting booked to play places i'm making putting flyers up and getting paid so it's a real thing but just just to make sure that i get into that good habit of like okay cool treat this like how you treat playing on the biggest stage ever in the world and yeah man like 
as much as I miss that side of it behind the booth, there's nothing like just being around that ambiance as well. Do you know what I mean? Just walking in. So like I said before in previous podcasts, like just standing outside and hearing the bass rattling through the doors. Like, boom, 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 boom. You know, having to check your, getting the door picker to check your ID, getting searched, all that stuff, man. It's just, you're just missing it. Even getting, you know, creeped up by and sniffed on by a flipping sniffer dog outside. Things that I would have thought would have been a bit demeaning back in the day. I'm now looking forward to them. So hopefully those days return very very soon and we can kind of all meet each other back on the dance floor because god damn it man i need some of it anyway moving on loads of things to get into loads of things to talk about obviously so make sure you grab yourself a little drink i've got myself a little glass of water you know keeping it high and tight is to get rid of these lbs these lockdown lbs are getting on my nerves i need to get rid of them before we progress so make sure you grab yourself a drink it's up and nibble and let's get in on the show so first things first there's an interesting development regarding um vaccine passports i think i forgot what airline it was but they recently came out and said oh no we're not actually you know news broke or news leaked that a certain airline were going to require our customers to have a vaccine in order to kind of fly on their airline and then they came out and actually said no i think it wasn't a vaccine it was a ticket it was ticket master one of those people like oh you can only attend an event if you have a vaccine long long term and of course they had to come out and sort of like you know um dampen the the, the frenzy online because most of the anti-vaxxers out there were like hey that's is, this is like a sign of a new world order but it got me thinking in terms of like what did people really think was going to happen like post all of this mass mess or that's happening at the moment do people le- legitimately honestly think we've returned back to normal and there'd be no changes there'd be no impingements on our civil liberties no impingements on our um ability to move there'd be no like heightened security or surveillance or intrusion and our personal matters if people think we would get away with this pandemic scot-free they were really gravely gravely mistaken we've already seen in different areas across the world where governments have basically taken this opportunity they've used covid as a sort of a cloak to get in and sort of do the nefarious things that they always wanted to do with our private information you know which is probably no longer has has no longer been hasn't been private for decades and decades and probably since the advent of the internet but regardless this is always going to be the inevitable um sacrifice or that we were going to have to basically make in order for us to kind of return back to a quasi normal way of living and this is another one this is a headline here from the irish post it says vaccine passports may become mandatory for long-haul flights with passengers required to provide proof of anti-covid jab so long-haul flights will require some sort of part you know medication passport and i think it's something that used to um i'm pretty sure it's something they used to do back in the day i remember when i said maybe when i was younger i remember someone hearing maybe my mom or dad someone someone saying something like oh have you got your stamp or something you used to get like a little stamp like for i don't know imagine if you was going to sub-sahara africa or parts of south america we'd have to get like a some sort of shot right southeast asia you'd have to have that stamped on your passport somewhere to kind of show that you got it within a certain time with certain window a right? certain date frame time frame right um six months whatever it may be so it's probably an extension of that or probably going back to that when we've been to the past so, cause this is the article here it says passengers may be required to prove that they've had a covid19 vaccine before flying going forward uh, special vaccination passports could be introduced that airlines can be sure that none of their passengers are spreading coronavirus it will be an official certification that someone has vaccinated for covid19 and could then be accessed online so the passengers would um, wouldn't necessarily need to carry it around like they did the original passport which is pretty good the, inevi- the initiative it's been considered by Australian airline Qantas, but would be um, rolled out for all major air, uh, international airlines if it's deemed successful. Of course, yeah, this is definitely something I'm, I'm sure is going to be rolled out in all different airlines. It continues, we're looking at changing the terms and conditions to say the international travellers that, um, that we seek that we are sorry we're looking to changing the terms and conditions to say the international travelers that will ask people to have a vaccination before they get on the aircraft said Quantaf chief executive alan joyce what we're looking at is how we have vaccination passports an electronic version of it that certifies that the vaccine is and if it's acceptable to the country to be traveling to 
It is understood that initiative will be implemented on long haul flights only, so domestic flights and short trips wouldn't require vaccination passport. Anyone flying from Ireland to the UK would likely be exempt from the measure, but those flying to Ireland to the US may have to provide proof of their vaccination. Australia has had some of the strictest border regulations restrictions, of course, is an important point throughout the pandemic, so it's no surprise that the Australian company should come up with such a strict measure, but if reduced um uh, but if it reduced the risk of spreading COVID around the world, then who would be against it? Good question. For international visitors coming out and people leaving Australia, we think that's a necessity, of course. And again, I'm I'm sure for the conspiracy theorists out there and for the people who think this is like the the sign of the Great Reset and, you know, we're going to be turning into automatons or whatever it may be, I get it. It's not the best of solutions. It's not something that, you know, most people will be happy with sharing their personal medical information with an airline. You're going into some very dodgy, dodgy territory. But unfortunately, I think we are just going to have to accept as gay as that new normal phrase is. That is exactly what it is. The new normal isn't this idea that we're going to have more places to go order from Uber Eats. That's not the new normal. The new normal is you're going to have to have introduced different procedures and processes to the things that you did previously, you know, in order for you to kind of prove that you're not going to be a risk wherever you're going to next. So the same thing that people were saying, remember back in the day, people were saying, oh, if you've got nothing to hide and you shouldn't be worried about getting searched on the airlines when, when, you know, um, when at the height of Islamophobia post kind of the 9-11 and you know um, of course um, suicide bombers were kind of spreading all over the place and everyone was sort of saying oh it shouldn't be a big deal so why I get searched and now look now we're all going to be suspects of having COVID we're all going to be kind of be looked at the side eye especially if you turn up to an airport god forbid with a cold or whatever it may be you're going to be definitely be treated like a bit of a leper so we you know we're having to accept these things and again if these are the little sacrifices we're gonna have to i say little again i know it's probably um um, famous last words but if these are sacrifices that we have to make in order for us to kind of return to some semblance of normality is that really much to give up on is it really i don't necessarily think so i'm i'm all right with it i don't mind in my personal opinion anyway moving on what else we have here we have a probably a bit of a cautionary tale here regarding this idea in the UK that we're going to have or spread it spread out across Europe as well. It's not just the UK, so I'm feeling a little bit more at ease with it. But in general, there's this um, idea that we're going to have it confirmed, hopefully, I think, in the next couple of days, that supposedly we're going to be given a little bit of a break before Christmas or, d- or during the Christmas holidays I think sometime before Christmas and a couple of days after so I say about three to five working days or three to five days over the Christmas holidays in order for different households to go and mix and celebrate Christmas as they do previously now at the time well when it was first announced it's like this is ridiculous right you should just scrap it and just let us you know sacrifice Christmas for this year so we can have a better new year but effectively what they're saying what i assume is happening is that most governments especially in europe are well aware that most people are just going to ignore whatever safeguards and measures and lockdowns and restrictions that they put in place anyway um during the christmas holidays everyone's going to just do what they want to do um in order to go and live as much of their life as they can during these testing times so in order to get in front of it and to ensure that it doesn't go too overboard they're introducing this like this sort of like temporary christmas passport that you can basically go to free up you can mix with three other different households so yeah that's the actual that's the complication it's not three different households it's three different households can mix in one home that's the actual thing so they're doing that in order to make sure people don't go too crazy and you know you have some sort of hand on the situation and it makes sense you know again like i said i'm i'm not for it but i definitely understand why some people would argue against would argue for it uh, in favor of, of it because especially if you've been abiding by the rules for the most part and you're seeing you know the the failures of the government every single day you're seeing people um, that have a little bit more what wealth and notoriety not really kind of abiding by the rules and just doing what the fuck they want so i can understand the desire to be like you know what if i'm gonna 
take a break from this lockdown if i'm gonna go out and try and enjoy myself to some level of normality it's definitely gonna be in christmas with family and friends that i know and love and like i said before you can mitigate a lot of the risk if you're really scared and you really want to make sure you have like a big group of people meet up together and not, not have any issues you could just make sure you quarantine before you go to christmas holiday celebrations 14 days either side and you're basically done you're basically fine so that's obviously one side of it but then there's a cautionary tale this article here from the us today it says after months of following covid19 guidelines a texas family let their guard down for one day and all 12 of them got sick mad story in it so this is from the us today it says the following alexa aragons said her family prided themselves on following the covid19 precautions for months before a dozen of them gathered for november the first for a low-key get-together now the family is warning others not to make the same mistake they did so they were on point doing what they need to do and they did let their guard down once just have a little get together and everything went tits up it continues <clears throat> within days everyone who attended had positive had tested positive and soon three other family members became sick as well weeks later the family is still reeling from the outbreak and those sickened are still battling symptoms aragon's told um us today her mother one of those who attended was hospitalized for a week and maybe uh, on medication for the rest of her life because of damage to the virus. She said, please don't be like my family, ignore the CDC guidelines. By staying apart, we can fight this virus together, Aragon said in a public service announcement published by the city of Arlington. So I guess that's this here. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Let's see what she has to say. This looks a bit sad. But let's Hello, see. everyone. I am a resident of Arlington, and I would like to share with you how COVID-19 has affected my family. Two weeks ago, I had family over at my house for, my, for some cake for my wife's birthday. I didn't think anything bad would happen. I went to my nephew's house and left Jesus seeing my family. But now, I'm fighting against COVID-19. Now I'm fighting coronavirus. We have COVID-19. All my family have COVID-19. In fact, everyone that went to my cousin's house that day has tested positive for coronavirus. Jesus Christ. Now, I'm in the hospital. Can't see my family. I cannot. Can you just imagine? Can you just imagine what I guess? What are they? Mexican, Central American, right? Latino. Just can you just imagine how close and tight they are as a family, right? Sharing everything, hugging, kissing, laughing, like just having a jolly good time. Little do they know this flipping virus is absolutely gonna decimate their entire family. Hopefully, they all get to get well very, very soon because this is tragic, mate. I can't have my wife. Now I can't visit my mom to share a cup of coffee or talk about our day. We can't run or play with our cousins. When we took my mom to the hospital, our hearts broke. The acting is amazing. <laughs> we feel guilty for Bad that brain. All this pain that my family's feeling, this loneliness, this sickness, this... Whoops, what happened there? Well, I don't know what it reloaded for. But hey, you, you get the gist of what they're saying, innit, right? Um, actually, let's just let's, let's finish. I don't know why I reloaded for. for, for by Hello, itself. everyone. Let's go I'm back. a red. Let's go back. All this pain yeah, that yeah. my family's feeling, this loneliness, this sickness, this longing to be healthy, could have been prevented. Maintain your social distance. Use a mask that covers your nose and mouth. Wash your hands often. Please stay at home. Please protect yourself. It's real. Please don't be like my family and ignore the CDC guidelines. By staying apart, we can fight this virus together. The cure starts and ends with you. Jesus Christos. But again, all that washing your face and your mask thing doesn't really matter if you're going to be sharing food and jokes with people for a prolonged period of time and you are, you don't know that one person's asymptomatic. And I guess that's the issue. Um, which again makes you think about that funny interview with bloody Jake Paul where he basically calls the, the whole thing a hoax but I'll get on to that later but we continue um <clears throat> that's a whole picture there of the family again there's probably a lot of mitigating circumstances here maybe some pre-existing conditions i don't really know but it's definitely not a fun situation it continues here multiple family members joined in a video to echo the same thoughts it's an example of how easy a virus can spread so but again this is the issue that we have here right if you just listen to the doctors and you go by what the scientists say then we won't ever leave our homes, right? We're going to be indoors forever. That's basically their um, advice. If you read between the lines and you kind of read up on all the reports, 
looking at all the findings, you do all the research, you watch all the YouTube live streams. For the most part, most scientists, most virologists are saying, hey, we're not really going to get a handle on this until we have a virus. There's no real way. We're basically even proven now. I think we've seen stories about, you know, how badly it's going in Sweden, supposedly, you know, even though they were doing the whole like um, uh, herd immunity thing. There is no kind of way to deal with COVID in its kind of, there is no way to sort of stamp out COVID without sort of making sure that people just aren't free to move as freely as they were previously. It's just not a way to do it, especially if you live in a place that's sort of like landlocked in some regards. If you're basically an island like New Zealand, maybe a little bit easier, but if you're a place like, you know, I don't know, Texas, a state in America, it's a bit difficult to reduce the spread of COVID without basically, you know, requiring the army to go on the streets and basically tell people that they can't leave their homes so the only way we're going to deal with it is obviously having you know um, a vaccine and obviously making sure we limit the amount of time to go out so we don't overload the medical services and blah 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 but unfortunately with your politician you have to sort of weigh up so many other things right so which is somehow why i have a little bit of sympathy for them going forward because you're having to weigh up you know the economy prospects right mental health um you know the well-being of people just in general um, with what you're seeing the information out there you're having to weigh those two things up and sometimes it's hard to come to a really clear decision that makes sense for everybody so i guess with christmas it's just one of those sacrifices they're going to have to make because i know everyone's going to ignore the rules anyway people are going to do what they want to do rightly or wrongly so i don't know man like again a bit of a warning but also just one of those things that you're just going to have to kind of grin and bear it's kind of one of those uncomfortable truths going forward like inevitably more people will unfortunately pass away that's just the way it is it looks like unfortunately um it just we're going to have to maybe get to a stage especially before well, you know especially in the interim before the vaccine gets approved and gets kind of rolled out we're going to have to get to a stage where we're going to have to maybe start asking ourselves or maybe the politicians will have to start asking them, themselves hey how many deaths are we willing to accept for us to move on as a society for us to move on for us to sort of get, get or not move on for us to get back to sort of some semblance of normality how much are we willing to accept that might be one of those kind of really grave questions that people you know the sort of like um philosophical questions right if you're in a car and you're about to career into an old lady or a mum with a kid where who do you who do you career into right and you know there's sort of loads of different branches that that sort of can digress on because you say it's an old lady but then you know you get told that she's the one looking after um a family member who's only eight years old and have any other family if she dies and that kid goes into care you know there's sort of like it can go on so those are the questions that they sort of have to weigh up in their head so as much as it can be satisfying to dunk on politicians during these times I don't envy making those choices and those decisions. I really, really don't, man. But hey, what can you do? Let's move on. What else do we have here? We also have an update, of course, across Europe. Due to COVID, there's obviously uh, everyone's doing a Christmas thing. So I'm a little bit more at ease with what we're doing here in the UK. I'm not as annoyed as I was previously. I just thought it was just a little bit stupid. Like we tried to save our summer. We tried to save the restaurants. Then they blamed us for going to the restaurants. Then they blamed the bars and they blamed the young people. Then they let all the kids go back to university. Then all those cases spiked. You know what I mean? There's been all this back and forth, but now seeing that a lot of other places in Europe have also taken the same approach with Christmas, it kind of leads me to believe that this is the only logical, sensible thing that they could do in order to make sure numbers stay somewhat reasonable heading into a new year. So this is a headline for the BBC. It says coronavirus, how Europeans are preparing for Christmas and New Year's. And essentially Italy has the same sort of situation. Many Italians um, head to ski slopes after Christmas and New Year, but Prime Minister Giuseppe Conti has warned against um, traditional breaks. He says we cannot afford it. It means popular ski resorts in the Alps and uh, Dolomites are likely to lose out on billions of euros. Um, Mr. Conti is looking at European consensus on keeping the ski resorts shut and other measures too. Da -da -da -da. What else is it? Many Italian regions are under a partial lockdown and travel between them is restricted. So it's even more restricted than it's here in the UK. These measures will remain in place until the 3rd of December. A report suggests that an emergency decree may see the results relax after the date. The exact details of the decree will be delivered later. But it's not all bad news. Mr. Condi has reassured children that Baba and Natali, Father Christmas, will be definitely be visiting exempt places. France, the same sort of thing. After weeks of national lockdown, President Emmanuel Macron has um has 
uh, restrictions will start to be eased from the 20th of November, but the majority of lockdown measures will stay in place until um, just ahead of the festive break in the 15th of December. Um, shops, theatres and cinemas will reopen in time for Christmas and people will be able to visit their families over the festive period. So that's what's happening in France and Italy. And then we've got Germany from December the 1st. Two households and a maximum of two, five people will be able to meet and children are under the age of 14 are not included in this limit. But there's going to be a temporary easing of the rules for up to 10 people to be able to meet between 23rd of December the 1st of January. Of course, same sort of thing we're doing here in the UK. The plan calls for discussions with the, uh, the religious communities to measures to reduce the contacts at religious services so everyone's sort of doing the same thing and then lastly spain the spanish government is is planning a different festive period with a limit of six people allowed at parties reports say it is clearly recommended that social gatherings in the run-up to christmas will be held at the restaurants terraces or other outdoor locations Sp uh, spanish families also traditionally celebrate the festival of the three kings with the parade on the evening of the 5th of january and the government will recommend that celebrations do not take place so that's a really big deal as well if you've been to spain you know how important the feast of three kings are so that's going to be a really big hit but again we're all sort of following the same rules so i guess we can take some sort of respite in that going forward what else do we have here let's move on from all the that um we've got this really disheartening clip here quick i'm going to play for you and then we move on from the covid talk this is from bbc2 saving britain's pubs with tom carriage a clip here where he sort of talks to various pub landlords and owners regarding what's happening with covid and how it's basically impacted them and you know you forget how much how important pubs and bars are especially in smaller towns we're about spoiled here in london where i am anyway i guess most major cities you are spoiled um with the abundance of bars restaurants whatever they may be but these sort of places in smaller towns are the hub that sort of knits the community together it's a meeting place it's also a place that people kind of share great fond memories right so it you can just imagine what it must be doing for these people's mental health to be going through opening up lockdown restrictions tears just a complete shit show in it and a lot of these people you know entire livelihoods are tied up in these places so it's more than just a business for them so let's quickly play this clip for you Greater March 2020. The whole country is in lockdown. My own pubs, those I've been helping, and more than 47,000 others are shut. With strict travel bans in place. Right, where shall I go? I'm asking the four pubs to keep in touch. Are you seeing anything? Yeah, go on, spin us around. And to film themselves. Hey, right, filming. As together, we try to navigate our way through this crisis. I think we're getting the hang of this now. It's eerie how empty they all are, man. Jesus. This is the hand of flowers. It's normally buzzy, busy, now it's just, it's just, it's like a balloon that's just been popped. There's, there's nothing. It's really sad. And it's also very, very frightening. It's really frightening. I opened this when I was 31 years old. Wow. I honestly don't know if I have the energy to do it all again. I guess the only good thing about this, right, because a little short clip there, the only great thing I think with this situation, I generally, generally am optimistic that once stuff does reopen, people will be gagging for a knees up, gagging for a drink, gagging for some sort of connection and meeting with strangers and hanging out, touching faces, rubbing shoulders, the banters and the flipping toilets will be epic, smoking area banter will be fucking legendary, right? I'm sure that's going to happen. But the issue is, can you survive until then? that's the major major problem and again for the government as well what can they do like they're in a, such a lose i guess in some ways all of the support that most of these places were asking for for the most part especially in the uk they were mostly just asking for hey allow us to reopen 
under some sort of like tighten restrictions, limited capacity, whatever it may be, but let us open in a COVID secure way without any sort of limits in terms of our opening times so that we can already, tr so we can try to get ourselves back on our feet, right? Because most places are like, hey, we don't want handouts, right? Government handouts, government grants take long to fucking process anyway. Not everyone's going to be applicable to get them. Cool, we don't want them. Allow me to basically put food on my own plate. Allow me to pay my staff. Allow me to, you know, um, fulfill my orders with my suppliers allow me to kind of return to being my hub for my local community and for some reason i guess again because the government the government officials were scared of being because most of my thing i think most of the decisions that have taken place especially with covid especially in the west are mostly fear driven or miss are mostly risk avoidance driven no one wants to be the person responsible for the number of deaths going up whatever it may be the spike right it kind of reminds me a little bit the weird an analogy but i remember listening to a football podcast and they were talking quite detailed about the whole Lionel Messi drama at Barcelona and one guy really early on basically was saying that hey he's not leaving you know when he first announced that he was going and he went to leave and the news got out there and did the whole interview with the goal and all this sort of stuff and everyone was like, oh my god he's actually leaving Barcelona one dude said very very early on he's not going anywhere and basically his real rationale behind it was that the president at that time of barcelona he already had a bit of a bad reputation anyway and people wanted him out they were basically blaming he was basically accused or he was basically regarded as a person to blame for barcelona's uh, sort of like recent demise over the last few years right so he was saying that basically politically he's not going to want to be the guy that was in charge and let messi go to another club where he ended up scoring 155 goals in the first season he's not going to let that happen optic for the optics wise right he'd rather sort of like hold him hostage have a player that doesn't want to be at the club anymore make a complete fuss of situation put him in an uncompromising position where and it eventually did happen right barcelona sort of backed Lionel messi into a corner and made him only have one way out which was you know to publicly you know to take them to court which he was never going to do he kind of came out and said that so that's sort of the same analogy there like the Barcelona president under no circumstances the, the one that was leaving was going to be the one that would want to oversee the 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 club when Lionel Messi left he'd rather give that to somebody else I think the same thing's happened with the governments and government officials and politicians no one wants to be the one that says okay cool let's reopen the pubs and bars and then have the numbers spike and then have loads of people die and then be blamed for it because you're never going to shake that right you look at flipping nick Clegg, and you know how he did the whole flipping u-turn on the whole student you know tuition fees back in the day right and that still that still follows him right people will never forget that sort of stuff so i think i have sympathy for them in some respects but and also on the other side of it i also think there was an easy win here you could have just allowed you know through consultation and you know whatever it may be and reading of the data because the stuff i've read so far the transmission rates in bars and pubs hospitality venues is super low so if that's the case you, there could have been a lot more interaction and communication with these places to be like hey this is what we've learned so far don't take the piss let's see how this works out and let's sort of you know review as we kind of go on and that would have made a lot more sense but to open up close open up close and then kind of restrict the hours of places that are already restricted anyway like i said a lot of the issues that we have in the uk with you know alcoholism are mostly man-made are mostly sort of like policy led where that you know they kind of limit the hours bobs and bars can open they don't really open really that late at night um they sort of cram people in before the hours of 12 you know drink promotions from the hours of five to seven people get absolutely blasted and then by the time they roll out of the clubs they're all you know they're melting right they you know stumble into a kebab or stumble into a fight it's all it's all a madness and this could have been a really good opportunity to sort of reset that and sort of change things around a bit but again what can you do what can you do okay moving forward what else do we have here to talk about before we head off i need to mention oh yeah need need to mention this because you know this has been all over the timeline I'm sure most of you guys are aware with um, the absolute madness Dachavelli has been getting himself into over the last couple of days. And I don't know, man, it's it's a hard one, isn't it? Don't know where to start with the old Dachavelli stuff. It's difficult. So again, um, to give you a bit of context, basically, on the issue, earlier on in the week, earlier on, I think last week, some soddy hacker somewhere who I'm sure Dachavelli and his team want to basically identify and probably hang up on a bridge somewhere. 
um, some little scrawny hacker or big hacker, whoever this hacker kid was, managed to get inside of various people's phones and leak various DMs. And Dutch Ravelli's was unfortunately one of those people. And the first few DMs were with him, with, me, with Drake, you know, they were a bit cringy, they were a bit embarrassing. It was basically like a one way conversation, him tagging Drake and those of his Instagram stories, sitting down, rolling a zoo, listening to Drake's music in the background, asking him if he could start over your London and getting crickets, like just horrible, right? Loads of messages to Drake and seem like that's probably my worst nightmare fair, fair enough drake is your friend or your industry friend the worst nightmare would be sending a message to somebody like that like heartfelt right because i'm sure you know the kids i think you forget as well dutch Valley's 26 27 right so drake is his jay-z in it this is like the dude at the moment so you can imagine how excited you are at that time you know you you've just become you know really successful um, your sister's doing bits in the scene. Drake loves you as an individual. Blah, 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 blah. It's not like even a co-sign thing. He actually appreciates what you're doing as an art, as an artist. And you're just guests of him. And, you know, London and the UK has a special connection with Drake anyway. We sort of love him like no other place probably outside of the United States. <clears throat> Maybe outside of Canada. So I can understand he is kind of wanting to connect, right? But, you know, that's been my worst nightmare. Somewhere that's be a friend and then you send a message and it's just seen. It's like... That's why I would never, you know, who, whoever follows me on there and you will know for the most part, but anyone of any sort of influence or notoriety, like I'm not texting or messaging you. Very good, anyway, move on. Dutch Valley does that. So, so far, messages are not too bad. And of course, it starts to get weird when he gets into a conversation with this, what's that girl's name again? Teznados or Tizen, Tizendos, Tiznas, whatever her name is, some girl, right? Um, again, no offense, but I don't really know these people too tough. But anyway, she's, a, I guess, a UK rapper, female rapper, right? And she's, you know, very high pitched voice, very young, very scrawny looking. So she kind of is, is deceptively young, but you know, from what I've read online, she's 18 years old. So it's just weird to see that, right? First of all, and then you see the images of the other blonde girl that he kind of supposedly allegedly hooked up with and a few others. And what I instantly took away from that was that, okay, this guy clearly doesn't have a type, right? He's clearly like, you know, um, he's clearly welcoming of all sizes, colors and creeds. That's a good thing. But it's also quite evident, I thought, in just looking at the girls who allegedly were involved with him, that he probably doesn't have that much experience. Again, this is not a path for the guy, because I don't want to get beaten up. But he definitely does have that much experience with girls, it feels like, because there was no real pattern in terms of the kind of bad bees you're sort of hitting up. They're all just random. That could be because it's a UK dude, right? And we're, I'm only seeing this through the lens of a US rappers, right? Um, maybe UK dudes are a little bit more, you know, international with their taste yeah, and what women they kind of get involved in but that already because kind of a bit of a sign a red flag for me because that is usually a sign of somebody being extra horny when they just you know lap up anything that slides into their dm so i was like god damn it and then of course little by little more dms come out and then allegedly there's this is dm with dutch supposed to be talking to a 14 year old who was allegedly a family friend um of um an ex-manager or something like this which is really bizarre and the messages themselves were just like like if that was my friend i just look at it that way because i think there's i think generally people i don't know what it is but we generally don't have sympathy for celebrities or people of um influence you know people of notoriety public figures we just don't have any sympathy i don't know why what it is some of people some people don't deserve it i guess through their actions i understand but for the most part i would try to extend some level of civility and sort of understanding to a situation so i would say if that was my friend, number one, you shouldn't be talking to any 14-year-old in the DMs, right? If that was my mate, I'd say, don't talk to any 14-year-old in the DMs. I don't care if that's your friend, your sister, like nothing. Like I wouldn't want to be talking to my sister on flipping DMs or Instagram live, right? I'd be like, get off my DMs and then call me, text me, do you know what I mean? Direct conversation. We don't need to be sliding into each other's DMs and sending each other heart eye emojis or flame emojis. That's just inappropriate. It's not on, especially with a family friend, right? It's just weird, right? Um, fair, fair enough with your with your family. I understand the lines can be blurred. If it's an actual blood family, yeah, it should contact whatever. But if it's your kind of extended family and it's sort of that little bit of a gap in Barry anyway, you always looked a bit as the older. You might have looked after her when she was younger and stuff. It just seems a bit odd enough. And then of course the added side of it is that they actually are family, so it makes it extra extra disgusting. So you're looking at that and you're like, Jesus Christos. And again, we don't know what happened. The messages could be construed one way. It's not, you know, it's when you shouldn't be judging people via the court of public opinion. But in terms of optics, in terms of what we just see so far, the evidence is not good. It really isn't good. And I guess a lot of the 
a lot of the evidence out there is obviously painting them out in a bad way but the thing that makes it worse is the reactions right the reaction from the dude who is i think the son of the manager that passed away the dutch valley's ex-manager him obviously basically going at um what's her name going at steph london in the dms actually let me try and get that up here now so i can show you here du, 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 du. right the brother actually like going um at Steph London in the DMs and you can see, you know, you can read in the background Steph London's message where she's insinuating in a way, roundabout way that the kid is unhinged because his father passed away or whatever. It just really looks bad because if that was a nothing situation, there's really no need for Steph London to come out allegedly, if that's according to what we see online, that hard and essentially um gaslight i guess the dude right and paint him out to be some way in order to kind of justify allegedly the actions of her brother and this i guess is the image here which is courtesy of you heard it here first on the twitter so i'll zoom in a bit here conversation between Seth london and the 14 year old cousin son of the Chevelli's manager who passed away so this is the message that she sent allegedly it says send your number please and i'm guessing that he uploaded this as well so this is not even from the hacker and she's continued to say it's mad what you're actually trying to do to my brother i spoke to Anne, and she explained everything and you deleted bare messages to make it look mad which again that could be the case but still my my thought remains if, if you're my friend and you're telling me look what my 14 year old cousin is sending me i'm going to tell you why are you messaging your 14 year old cousin you know what i mean that'd be a serious conversation that'd be a slap your phone out of your hand situation especially if you're dutch and i'm your friend you know what i mean you're my mill ticket out of the ends i'm not gonna let you fuck this up by talking being extra horny in the dms like allow it it continues um dutch might have gone about stuff wrong with you guys friendship but what but i'm sure it all could have been sorted out i'm sure this is not what your dad would have wanted as he was um the guy who brought you lot together which is again you can't be putting on people like that <sighs> should i take it back no you can i, I understand right she's that that's her baby brother right she's gonna do whatever she can to protect the dude and i think some people are maybe chastising Seth London a little bit too unfairly yeah like she's not gonna come out and just label her brother a nonce that's not gonna happen she's gonna defend him as best he can especially if she thinks it's a private conversation so that i don't really play too mind too much mind to but again it makes dutch look worse if this obviously is a nothing situation you don't need to go to your sort of lengths he continues here he says i'll be praying for you go to jesus christ honestly deep down i know you're a good kid and i'm really sorry you had to go through the pain losing your dad please find someone to talk to and don't hold all your emotions in like how, how dare you come on man that's a piss day you can't talk to people like this i just you tell the truth so of course let me quickly i'll play a little bit of the guy actually talking so you can hear what he had to say about the situation because he's not happy at all Steph, listen, you know what this is about, innit? Like, your brother's grooming a 14-year-old girl, child, flirting with her, asking to see pictures of her toes and, and getting a koozie in the hot tub and, and you see it, you know it as well, and that's what's fuckery. Like, come on, man, like, you got a daughter yourself. There's vulnerable girls that look up to you. So see if you're advocating for this type of fuckery. It just says yourself. I know, obviously, it's your family, it's your brother. You're going to want to have to say something because that's what, it's, it's a certain responsibility, but you better say the right things as well, innit? Because you and I know, Steph, you know the fuckery that's been going on. Come on, man. Like, you know the fuckery that's been going on. Seriously. Like, what, 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 what can I say? Like, it's grooming. He's grooming, yeah? My dad... Which, you know, is just, and again, this is, this is just, as again, if we just believe what we see online, we don't know this whole truth of the matter, but still, the optics look absolutely terrible, like terrible. There's no situation or no circumstance, in my opinion, again, if he's my friend, there's no situation or circumstances that I would think it would be appropriate for one of my friends to be talking to a 14 year old let alone somebody that was a family member it just wouldn't be on especially and then add to add all the context to it supposedly this is the daughter or the family member of a manager that passed away there's just a certain regard and esteem that you would hold that person up that you wouldn't even want to it's not even something that would even enter your head that's the actual question regarding and again 
not to put a smile in anyone's name, but putting into context, you know, looking at the women that came out, looking at different age ranging, the randomness of them. It just, it all just speaks to somebody that doesn't really have that much experience, you know, being around girls and stuff. And guess it's getting gassed up over all the fame that he have and the access and whatever it may be. But still, does does it excuse it? Of course, it doesn't excuse it because, on the same token, if you've got all that access and you've got the fame and the notoriety that you have, because it, it made me think, especially even with this whole like. Um, stuff with octavian going on it's like i don't think these guys really appreciate or value the fact that they're famous in this era doing rap nowadays right uk rap or uk hip-hop for the most part outside of some of the special talents that exist it's looking like a bit of a cash grab right everyone's sort of deciding to do music now because it's easy quote unquote to make it it's easier to sort of quote unquote get signed it's easier to gain an audience and really oddly enough right this is the only era legitimately and maybe outside of the garage uk funky time when i was kind of coming up where people in on our own shores uk people actually care about uk artists sometimes even more so than they care about international acts it's really freaky like it's the only place i think maybe exists that way maybe i would imagine parts of france germany spain italy or maybe not spain Italy. i'd say france maybe holland i'd imagine a lot of their sort of like urban population right while mostly infatuated with overseas acts whereas in the uk it's different everyone sort of gassed off of their own kind of local heroes people from their area people that they went to school with are kind of blowing up and becoming famous and stuff it's just an incredible time to be a uk artist right now right in terms of actually making money being a success and being famous and rich and having the ability to take your family out from poverty and make great music with people that you kind of looked up to and of course if you're just a single dude running the streets you have access you have the eyes and the attention of all the bad bees that exist from you know from Portsmouth all the way up to flipping Edinburgh so for somebody like himself to get in a situation like this where you're talking allegedly to a 14 year old it's just there's no excuse for it like there is no excuse for it there's you have too many options right you have too many options and again I'm, I, I'm not gonna sit here and say anyone's a nonce or a Peter because we don't we just don't know in it we really just don't know but putting all those kind of mad things to one side if it's just a horniness thing this is mad unacceptable isn't it like you have access to basically anyone that you want for the most part outside of paying them for their services legitimately access to people like why do you need to do this like really why do you need to do this and of course in the uk you know we have this especially if you think about like in terms of recent news with the with that guy that got you know arrested in Mitchum or South London that went all over the timeline that you know some girl bravely recorded a video of a dude trying to abduct a girl in the midst of you know a really heinous sexual assault which you know gladly social media came to the rescue and kind of identified him very quickly and he was arrested I think within the day or two of it happening so we're very sensitive to that sort of thing right we just don't accept or stand for it in maybe the same way our american customers or our american um, brothers and sisters do on that side of the pond in it we just are very sensitive to the whole pedo kids thing i definitely understand that and I, again unfortunately for dutch and unfortunately for anybody that gets cancelled nowadays or now it feels like it's the worst time because everyone's at home everyone's got nothing to do everyone's on their phone so everyone's paying extra attention to the things you're doing and again in context with the kid that got picked up in mitchum even if you're a fan of the kid like what's worse like seeing the messages that you see here or seeing what that guy allegedly was doing to that girl in the alleyway and picking her up and trying to take her somewhere like they're probably they're probably both in the same category of nastiness if we're still if both if dutch very situations to be believed right they're both in the same category of nastiness so you effectively have to treat them the same sort of way but again the uk's scene is very very politically correct and there's too many kind of you know um can, there's too many i guess relationships at stake and money as well tied up and because it's really surprising that you know you, you saw octavian's record label come out pretty quickly and disavow him right you saw people in the industry come pretty quickly and disavow him you saw his he saw his situation dry up very very quickly in up to his album but then with dutch nothing sort of changed nothing sort of moved if anything we just had people online sort of debating about it as i am here and i guess um one of his strongest critics so far has been outside of course his ops or people that kind of want him to sort of fail so they can sort of take his space um bouncer has some really 
um, good things to say about the situation that I've kind of really greatly agreed upon. Um, so let's definitely hear what he has to say here. Coming up, let it load one moment. Here, here we go. Let's see what Bounce has to say regarding this issue. <clears throat> Yo, my people, um, I had to delete my previous post because it compromises the girl's address and I don't want people um, going to her house. She must be going through mad trauma and I apologise to the family. Um, obviously, but man can't brush this under the carpet. Do you know what I mean? You got Dutch grooming a 14 year old. Like this is this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. I see UK gossip posted. I see Shade Bar posted. These other pages need to have the same energy and post and cancel this youth, bro. Because this is madness. You get me? When Wiley done a madness, everyone was posting that. They had that energy. They rubbed him out. Why ain't man posting this? Come on, industry guys, what's going on? Labels, rappers, come on, bro, post this. Like. Any female, anyone, if this is anyone, what, is this okay? Bro, the industry is fake. Cancel the industry. And I guess we've always kind of known that, and I guess, again, not to bring up his name because he has nothing to do with this, but I look at the whole skeptic situation and I think to myself, like, if anybody else, if anybody else outside of hip hop or UK rap had two friends go down for what his two friends went down in Sion and what Solo 45 went down for, it'd be very sticky for their career going forward in it and i guess in some ways it's quite refreshing because it seems like there is a bit of a um you know keep them at arms left let them do what they're doing over there sort of approach when it comes to dealing with you know sticky topics or allegations concerning uk rap people and stuff whatever it may be but in some regards there's also a lack of like self-policing I'm not for, you know, I'm not trying to get people to call in a cavalry and get people locked up in Belmarsh, but there needs to be a little bit more self-policing amongst our own quote-unquote community. I'm not really a community really because whoever's up is the sort of guy that gets all the blessings and whoever's down doesn't get a look in. But for the most part, if we are a so-called community, there needs to be a lot more policing amongst ourselves to basically be keeping everybody on the, you know, on the straight and narrow because effectively, situations like this aren't only fucking up the bag for him they're fucking up the bag for everybody else that gets associated with him right people that have projects lined up features videos loads of money gets messed up due to someone's kind of reckless behavior you know disgusting behavior wherever it may be so when there's no checks and balances amongst ourselves and then we're having to kind of look to others it sort of fucks up for everybody else because imagine you know you have you know two pretty high profile acts in the uk like octavian and let's say dashavelli get dropped by their labels that's definitely going to have some sort of effect on other people getting signed it's going to have be a, there's going to be a bit of a calling off period they recently announced they just launched a flipping Def Jam UK division, right? That's those things can definitely affect other things down the line, different parts of business. So there needs to be a little bit more accountability in that regard. So I liked what he had to say. There was obviously a comment here by a lady called La 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 Speaks or something. I don't know who that person is, but I saw this posted on the Shade Room as well. Gossip, sorry. And she says the following Dutch Valley 27 is a UK rapper last week. His insta was hacked and screen recordings emerged that allegedly show a conversation between him and a 40 year old female relative. The conversations mainly involve him reacting with heart emojis and flame emojis to her insta stories, as well as them arranging to meet, which luckily judging by the DMs again, it didn't look like they actually met in real life. I think this is what basically is saving him. I think from the looks of it, but it continues. She sends him a picture of a couple where a man is embracing a woman and behind it, he suggests recreating that picture. He also asks for pictures of her feet. Yeah, that's an odd one. So I don't know if that's what Steph London is saying is true about the daily messages, but she did send him a picture of um, Ruby Rose and Lil TJ, right? Back when they were dating and they sort of posed in front of a video mirror. Number one, I didn't know that was a thing anyway, that girls like have pictures of other people they don't know and want and kind of look at them longingly. I guess that's where the whole idea about relationship goals comes in. But I didn't know that was a thing. Regardless, that's a thing. She sent it to him and just sends it, doesn't say anything. And he sort of kind of initiates and pushes for the whole like, to get an answer from it and then offers up um, 
a solution says oh we're gonna recreate that one day babes it's like yeah 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 anyway it continues whilst the conversation never became explicit there can be no doubt that in any adult's mind that their exchange is flirtatious and slash suggestive he has denied the allegations and gaslit the public by stating that it must be something wrong with us for perceiving that this is being inappropriate his family and his girl's family have jumped to his defense nothing has been mentioned in the mainstream press which is definitely true i tried to actually get an article about it online to basically do a rundown and i couldn't find one um it continues i wanted to use this opportunity to discuss grooming she says grooming is an offense where somebody builds up a connection with a person so that they can manipulate and exploit and abuse them often for sexual purposes and whilst i'm not stating that this is what Tasha valley was doing there are grounds enough in this case for the police to investigate yikes um she's definitely going for it um sexual exploitation of this na ma nature is insidious insidious sorry it happens slowly over time it creates a scenario where the child feels like they have a real relationship with a the groomer they believe that they're in control and in love they don't see it as abusive adults should not be having suggestive conversations with teens even if it appears that the teen wants or is enjoying it that's the basic crux of it like i said in the beginning if that was my friend i'm not encouraging any communication with teenagers i just don't understand it i've never understood it have you don't you guys have like teenage relatives and friends or you know or you know um little brothers of best friends or whatever you know you, yeah your best friends or brother or whatever maybe or people that you know uh, have you spoken to them for a prolonged period of time like it's not the funnest conversations even if they're girls right girls do mature a little bit quick a little bit um quicker than boys do but talking to a 14 year old girl is no way equivalent to talking to an actual woman uh, a person of actual age so to actually try to involve yourself in any sort of like you know romantic relationship or flirtation vibe with them it's just bizarre beyond belief to, in my experience i don't know about anybody else but it continues um the teen's willingness is not indication of consent nor does it lessen the evils of the abuser a teen is never able to consent to sexualized conversations the dynamics um, leave them widely open to harm grooming and abuse and perpetrators are nearly always known to the victim and their family often they are family members we must educate our children on how weird it is for an, any adult to want to befriend them and we must create a space where they feel safe to let us know if this is happening which is true don't get me wrong i definitely understand i definitely feel Think there are some girls out there especially teenagers who would who are very aware that talking to any sort of adult in a sexual nature is obviously not good right and so you're going to get both people into trouble and it's obviously something that's going to be damaging to them long term but they obviously try and do it in secret behind closed doors the child side of things that's where i think it's up to responsibility in general most adults would say that it's the responsibility of the adult to take child situation and say hey this is inappropriate and step away from it i think because this whole idea like you know oh she's coming on to me what can i do that's like some creepo bullshit excuse if you're the adult in this conversation if you're the adult taking place if you're the adult who's even put yourself in this situation which you shouldn't have but imagine it's happened you're the one that should be putting it put a stop into it right removing yourself from the conversation um alerting somebody else whatever it may be but you should be the one taking charge you shouldn't be allowing or indulging in any of these kind of conversations because at the end of the day like it's just not on i mean and there's nothing you, just, you have no leg to stand on really in terms of excusing your actions um and then i guess to end naturally we have you know dutch Valley's mum coming out and obviously defending her son which you know you can definitely understand it's obviously not the best of things that you want to actually see on the timeline um it is a bit disgusting in terms of you know in terms of the allegations that are being levied out there from him to come out and say what she said just screams a little bit it's a little bit um inconsiderate <laughs> Um, where is it oh, I don't, actually no let's let's move on to that actually the, forget the mum the mum said what she said but there's actually a statement from the actual girl's family herself right so which makes it a bit hard to continue talking about this because in some essence in some in in essence they've sort of like put a basically a lid on it and basically said it's not a big issue everyone's kind of overreacting um and again whether or not we think this um, statement from the family is actually um honest and truthful or whether or not it's a statement that's been bought out whatever it's been alleged in, on, on the timeline on the social if the family are okay with it and they're fine with what they see on the dms and they've basically chastised the girl maybe in private or whatever kind of conversation what more can we do as people i mean as basically spectators on the outside not really i don't really sure if police can even investigate this issue if the family said there's no real problem i'm not really sure but anyway the statement from the family is you know it reads like a 
um it reads like a press release that you would expect from a family trying to rescue a situation that's got way out of hand and of course considering what's at stake with you know Dutchavelli's career and of course Steph London's career as well because this affects a lot of money um I'm sure there were a lot of things at stake in terms of putting this together so they had to do what they had to do so the official statement says the following the past few days have been extremely distressing for me and my family my personal address and family's private Instagram profiles have been exposed on social media and I feared for our privacy and my daughter's mental well-being family business and internal issues are being exposed and manipulated in the most disturbing way cool to excuse um someone to excuse someone that me and my daughter see like a family of anything sorry accused of anything sexual towards a minor is horrifying firstly i'm a mother and there is no amount of money or anything else that could make me stand by and support anyone who would be even the slightest bit inappropriate towards any of my children and i would put my own life on the line for my kids and their safety and nothing is more important to me which is some strong words there to open with but you know we've all seen cases where family members have done probably the worst things to their own kids or parents especially you know in the in the pursuit of money fame notoriety whatever it may be so you know whatever it continues nothing inappropriate has ever taken place between my daughter and dutch Avelli. we are always all together in family settings as a group messages have been deleted and conversations distorted such as people um claiming he was asking to see pictures of my daughter's feet when it was a professional picture of some of our chanel shoes on the model's foot um another photo that is private that the family joke uh, there's a private family joke he has says he will recreate that the s sign being shown is being twisted to fit a narrative okay fair enough um there are explanations for the flirtatious message but the internet and the blogs have a nasty way of turning things around to make it fit a sensational headline so that thing as well that supposedly that's to do with the mum so it's allegedly the mum or whoever the older adult in his family was allegedly sending flirtatious messages to dutch via that young girl's instagram which is bizarre to say the least right but again you know we can't tell people how to parent and we can't tell people how to conduct themselves on social media but that is their excuse and then from what they're saying up here this basically lends credence to what steph london's talking about about the message being deleted but i don't know it sounds it seems odd because first of all i'm sure the messages that we saw first got publicized or got brought to our attention because of a hacker right and then once those messages came out whoever that kid is who was kind of getting that dutch of getting that stuff done via the voice notes he's the one that then went into his own dms on instagram and exposed the message that stuff done sent to him right i'm assuming or is a hacker that kid i don't know but it's just enough something doesn't add up here um she says i don't know who hacked the account and i've never accused my nephew of doing so i spoke to stephanie steph london to explain the six messages that were being spun negatively from situations that were all innocent but even that was taken out of proportion by the blogs and used against us as a family i can vouch for all the messages that appear to be inappropriate that have been leaked to the public and to stephanie uh, stephen's character and fully understand the context in which the message was sent stephen has been extremely supportive of our family since the passing of my brother-in-law and the situation is deeply hurtful i do not take the allegations lightly and i had the shadow of the this uh and if i had a shadow of a doubt in my mind then i would be handling this completely differently it appears that there are many unhinged and unwell people who are using situations as a way to endorse their own personal vendetta to destroy someone else's entire life using my 14 year old daughter as a weapon to further their agenda if people were genuinely concerned of my daughter and i they would be stop dragging us through the hell and put a sickening story to an end mm, that's not really fair in it you're kind of that's kind of obfuscating obs what's actually happening out there but hey the police have been informed and this is a criminal offense therefore i will be seeking legal action against anyone who continues to publish my child's private messages um along with our personal information the police are not investigating Ste uh dachavelli stefan and if they had any concerns at all they would be taking the things further and it would not be addressing the situation again <sighs> signed ab so yeah i don't know man like hey if the family are okay with it and they're fine and they've made their statement i guess we have to move on it just is what it is it's concerning it's not a really good situation for all involved but hopefully this is a learning moment 
for all people especially men out there to don't put themselves in situations where you're speaking to a flipping teenager or you know in any way shape or form you don't need to be doing that especially if you're somebody of notoriety especially if you're somebody well known don't get yourself in trouble for nonsense things because you just horn you on the timeline you know what i mean like bloody shut down instagram load up porn up whack whack off and go to bed do you know what i mean you don't need to be speaking to teenagers and i guess for teenagers out there it's just gonna be another learning teach another learning moment to basically know that you shouldn't be involved in conversations with adults especially in a flirtatious manner under any circumstances because um that's probably grooming <laughs> you know what i mean and it's definitely going to cause you a lot of damage and pain in the future and again glad nothing really bad happened um again to say it's just innocent messages is really reducing what's happened but it's just, it is just messages it is just stuff we saw online so far no one's been actually hurt irl and hopefully you know all parties can sort of move on from this and sort of gather their force and go from here but again it's definitely exposed some flaws in the scene it's exposed some flaws in the industry and just basically shown um in some ways in my which we all kind of know in it if you've got some level of notoriety you can essentially get away with murder unfortunately but hey ho that is it for that one anyway that might be it you know yeah that's it for the action episode number 493 oh no 493 403 i wish it was 493 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe leave a comment down below and if you're listening via the podcast app please give me a five star review and share the show with your friends that'll be much 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 appreciated and again until next time i'll see you guys again very very soon of course make sure you smash the patreon get on the patreon get on the patreon patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o access it down below link attached down below in the description of the podcast or while you're watching the video slap on there get involved one bonus episode per week get involved don't delay i'll see you guys again very very soon until then take care be safe peace